Hello and welcome to Expo North, um, our, to our creative conference. And today we're talking with Christopher Rayburn on sustainable fashion design. Hi, I'm Joan Johnston. I'm the fashion craft and textile advisor for Expo North. For those of you who are new to Expo North, we support creative industries in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland. So I'm delighted that we've got Christopher here with us today, particularly as he's just flown back um, on a long flight and he's live from his studio, uh, which is great. Um, Christopher is recognised for his pioneering work in sustainable fashion design and has brought responsible design into the, the luxury sector. His remade um, ethos in particular has pioneered the reworking of surplus fabrics and garments to create innovative and um, functional pieces. Christopher has collaborated with many great brands, including Timberland, The North Face, Montclair, Bar uh, Barber, and Finisterre, just to name a few. And I'm sure we'll hear more from Christopher on those shortly. Um, in our session, Christopher's going to walk through the studio. Um, so there'll be uh, a good interactive um, session, seeing some of the live work going on within the studio. So on that, I'm gonna hand over to Christopher and let you take over from here. And we will take questions um, if you want to pop them in the Q&A box and then we can we can raise them with Christopher. Thanks very much. No, thank you so much, um, Joan. It's a real, real pleasure to be here. Um, to let the audience know what I'm hoping will happen in the next um, sort of 15 minutes or so before myself and Joan hopefully do a Q&A together and then open up for, for other questions from the audience. Um, I thought rather than doing a PowerPoint presentation and talking about my work that way, I thought it would be much cooler to do a studio tour and explain a little bit about the way that I work in, um, as you mentioned, Joan, a bit more of a uh, sort of interactive way. So for... Um, Anyone that knows nothing about me, I'll just explain a little bit about my, my background and um, in sort of my career. I studied um, fashion design uh, at BA at Middlesex University, so North, North London, and graduated all the way back in 2004. And I went on to do a master's degree in women's wear, um, fashion design at the Royal College of Art, so um, MA women's wear, and graduated then in 2006. And um, I think in the audience, maybe we've got some people looking to start their own creative companies and, and sort of kicking things off. So maybe it's good to understand what happened next for me. When I left the Royal College, the only thing I knew was I didn't want to work full time for anyone else. And so I got a part time job working as a pattern cutter in, in London, doing design work freelance for, for other designers here in, in London. And I was working three to four days a week. And at the same time, I set up my own very small studio up in Luton, uh, above an old J-cloth factory. And um, things have kind of grown step by step from there. And this now is my fifth uh, studio. And we are over in East London. We're over in Hackney, Hackney Central. And the building itself um, used to be the old Burberry textile building. So between 1935 and 85. Burberry were making hundreds of thousands of pieces right here in, in East London before it became the headquarters, which is pretty cool to have. Um, it's been a space, I guess, with such history. And um, as we look around here, I guess the space is kind of quite unique because as a business, we're entirely transparent in the way that we work. The big windows sort of indicate everything. When we moved here, I wanted people to be able to see what we do as a business. And we are even open to the public two days a week, you can actually come in and see uh, hands-on what we do. And I'm just going to take a little jump back to explain a bit more about my design process and some of the um, the projects that I've worked on. And this now is um, kind of scary for me to say, but this is the first coat that I ever made. And this was all the way back in 2001. So when I was a first year um, university student, as I mentioned at at Middlesex, uh, this, I'll just bring it close to the camera, was a jacket made, you can see here, this will be upside down, but from original jackets from 1954. And I'm just going to show you one of the original jackets, which look like this one here. And um, I've always been very, very, I guess, quite open and honest that I almost started a sustainable or responsible company almost as a happy accident because I loved amazing authentic materials, functional and utility materials like this beautiful wool that you see here. And what fascinated me was that if you wanted to buy the material on a roll, 
either it was very, very expensive, understandably, really high quality wool, 1950s, or it was really difficult to find. But back in 2001, I was going to markets here in London, but actually all around the country, and finding jackets like this, still wrapped in hessian and waxproof paper, in bales of 25, and they'd never been opened, never been worn. And so me, <laughs> I guess I was kind of interested in this idea that, wow, there's all of this cool stuff already out there. Do you always need to go and buy something new? And then the other really interesting part about all of this, um, and Joan, I might put you on the spot a little bit, if I may, have a guess at how much a jacket like this, dating again from 1955, in this instance, um, guess how much they were costing? Uh, was that then or now? Yeah, back in 2001. Back in 2001. Oh, my goodness. Um, I would say you might have got it for about 40, 50 pounds. Wow. Okay. So this is where it gets really interesting. They were costing one pound each. Oh, my goodness. So there's something quite interesting. If you want to buy the material, even then it was 15, 20, 25 pounds a metre. It's completely understandably because wool manufacturing, it's incredibly highly skilled, up to 200 processes. Um, but yet there were these things that already existed. And so for me, I've almost looked at the, the work that I do, like um, a kind of archaeology, going out and finding these cool things that already exist and then making them into new relevant products. And um, yeah, the, 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 the sort of idea that I started first at university that then has become the core of our, our business I called the idea not made in England, but remade in England. This idea that you could take something that already existed and completely deconstruct it and rework it. And so jump forward a few years, and I'm going to show you something kind of cool in a big bag. And again, I might ask for a bit of help from you, Joan, if you're able to tell me what this is. <laughs> it's a parachute, and is it made of silk or is it... Uh... Yeah, good, really good question. So this, you're spot on, it's a, it's a parachute, a pilot's parachute in particular. And you're right to say um, it could have been silk from the 1930s, 40s, they used to be silk. Then from 1950s forward, they replaced it with nylon. Yeah. So this is actually a nylon parachute made about 20 years ago in this instance. And the really cool thing about these, they're used by pilots actually all around the world. And particularly interesting for us, if I show you the different colours, you've got the white, you've got this gold colour, the green and orange. And that is because of the pilot, if he or she needs to eject and they want to camouflage in the snow, in the desert or in the forest, they can. Or if they want to be seen, there are different ways that they can use the orange panelling basically to, to break up, they'd have a knife in their kit and they cut the part that they need and then they make it into, um, sorry, and then they use it to camouflage or to be seen. Great like combinations as well. Yeah, exactly. And for me, it sums up beautifully what we're all about as a business because it's this thing designed for pure function, but then it has um, a kind of playfulness to it as well and a really cool narrative behind it. So as I then go through... The studio and again if i just show you around here the vast majority of what you'll see in the background has been remade from something else so every year we take parachutes like i've just shown you and make them into beautiful tote bags that look like this and each one is completely different and then we have a whole studio space here where we do everything from making parkers and different anoraks and kind of you name it we can make it right here in the space so we have a really talented team working away here looking very busy hey 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 um and then if i come through this way as well we've got zori who's our head seamstress who's working at the moment on a combination this part of the collection we call parasuit so the idea of actually taking an original parachute that you can then make into kind of lightweight, soft tailoring, really good for, um, for travel and things like that. But basically, we call this the Rayburn Lab. And so the whole space, it's all about experimentation. Within reason, we can kind of make anything here. And so all of our remade pieces, each one is unique. And we do a maximum of 50 anyway, so it's really a labor of love. 
Um, so yeah, just to sort of give you a little tour here as we go through. And then for any of the, I guess, um, maybe designers or, or young creators maybe looking to start out, the really important thing is that I'd like to kind of reinforce the fact that we don't just do remade pieces because if we did, our business would be tiny, very, very, very niche. So we have an ethos that's really helped to guide us as a company. And we call this the three R's. So you'll see at the top, the remade, and that's the real driving philosophy for the company. So it's all of the pieces being made right here at the studio, like you guys have just seen. And then we have two further parts we call reduced and recycled. And with the reduced products, it's all about um, items that are doing everything they can to reduce their impact on the environment. So really high quality jersey made from organic cotton, got certified, all done in the right way. Um, merino knitwear, really high quality, Hainsworth wool, for example. So where we can, we're, we're sourcing locally as well. And, and of course, making the highest possible quality product. But it means, of course, jersey, a white t-shirt for Rayburn isn't just a white t-shirt. It's something that's really going to last for a long time. We offer free repairs for life on all of our products as well. So we really try to um, engage with our customers on, on that kind of level. And then just to show you a few examples of the recycled products. <clears throat> So pieces like this, and I'll show you one of the more vibrant ones. They do come in black and olive and all the sort of commercial colours. But the nice thing here, hopefully this will show up on the screen, is if we have a little look at the hood detail and all of the grow grains. So the taping is called grow grain that all comes together. It mimics the original parachute, and it's really then a big part of our, our DNA. But the great thing about all of these pieces, they've been made from PET recycled materials. So all of those plastic bottles we're diligently recycling can be chipped, made into pellets, made into fiber. And then we're buying material that's fully certified made from that um, post-consumer waste. And in short, those three things help to support one another. So the remade becomes really the philosophy, the driving force for the company. It definitely gets the eyeballs and it's maybe what we're known for best. But increasingly, it's the reduced and the recycled elements that are really helping to support our business. So we work with um, stockers like uh, Selfridges here in the UK, but many around the world. And we've just opened our own store as well in, in central London. And it's been really interesting now where we're meeting customers firsthand. And um, yeah, kind of, I, I guess, step by step. We're starting now to build our own business, I guess, in a kind of non-conventional way insofar as it, it, maybe it's a bit more um, traditional in terms of word of mouth and people, you know, customer retention and building things um, step by step from there. Uh, but it's been really, really interesting. Excuse the car horn. And I just want to show a couple more examples of just some of the collaborations that we've worked on and how... Um, through the, the learnings of Rayburn, you're able then to bring products that potentially can come to scale as well. So I'm going to show one more remade item first because it's one of my favourites. So you're going to help me out again here, Joan. Uh -huh. can, can you tell me what this one is? That's a map, obviously, of something. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to open it up. No trick questions here. It's a map of the world, all right, mostly. Um, can you see the top there? Uh, yes, Stockholm, Riga. Yeah, so you've got Stockholm and Riga, and then on the other side, you've got Oslo. Mm -hmm. And then if I come in, this might be a bit more tricky. Can you see the date? Oh, yeah, 1953. So these are original silk maps made for the Royal Air Force, so made for pilots. Perfect. They used to, they used to print onto um, fabric and specifically silk rather than paper, because paper can perish if it gets wet. And, of course, for a pilot, that would be problematic. And the really cool thing with the tightness of the weave, the, the basic the quality of the denier, means you can get amazing detail mm -hmm. on the silk. And we're able to take pieces like this and just wash them in a normal washing machine on a delicate wash and make them into dresses like this. So from the original silk mat. So it's a really different way of looking at, at materials and I guess to a certain degree kind of waste or what waste is or isn't, and all of the stuff that's already out there and how you can, can kind of rethink it. 
And I'm going to show you some fun things. <coughs> Bear with me. Because I know very kindly on the, the introduction, you mentioned a few of the companies that we've been, been fortunate to work with over the years. And I'll just show you a few, few cool things. We've done projects with the North Face where we've been able to take original tents that couldn't be repaired and make them into beautiful bags that look like this. And then we've even done some pretty unexpected things where a North Face puffer jacket can become a panda that looks like this. So we're able to take one original, they're called Nupsy, the um, North Face jackets, and then make it into one of these guys. And I do think it's really important to have a bit of a sense of humour in all of this. You know, a lot of what we do, it's hard work every day. You need an incredible team. And uh, <laughs> yeah, these definitely brought the smile. And then one of the things that I've been really um, most proud of uh, is an ongoing relationship now with Timberland. So I've worked with Timberland for five years. And um, again, I'm going to need a bit of your help. And just for the audience, Joan and I haven't prepared this at all. So she has no idea what I'm about to show you. Absolutely. I'm going to get away. So, Any idea what okay, these might some, be? It's obviously a glove of some form. Um, is this <laughs> for uh, the Antarctica or somewhere like that? Oh, yeah, you've done well. Yeah, they're extreme cold weather. Mitten. Yeah. So used by, by the military, you're right, in Antarctica and the Arctic. And we've not done anything to these. I found these exactly as they are in a, in a military circus store. And on the inside, you've got this really beautiful quilt. And they are so warm. And in London today, I think it's nearly 30. Perfect for a day like this, right? <laughs> anyway, working with a, with a really big brand like Timberland, we're able then to take something, let's say, quite um, a bit abstract. But then we took one pair of gloves. In fact, not even one pair, just one, one side. And I was able to then make the glove into first a boot that looked like this. And that quilted liner, let me see if you can here. And then we did one more state, which looked like this. So again, all completely remade from the original glove. But then working with the design team, we made into a commercial product that was made, you know, tens of thousands of pairs, which then was done with a, a natural rubber, a regenerative leather, and actually a re recycled upper in that instance. And it's part of the collection, I'm not sure how well you can see on the inside, but uh, called Earth Keepers. And Earth Keepers is really the pathfinder for Timberland. So it allows Timberland to kind of test, learn, scale. Um, but it's kind of cool to think that even, let's say, with quite um, a specific approach to design, you can impact a, a, you know, a really big company on, on that kind of scale. And then this was something we worked on now just over a year, two years ago. But just recently, we've known launched um again something i'd say quite unexpected for timberland you would maybe normally think of the yellow boot so a little bit more in this world but increasingly we're working on much more progressive silhouettes and the nice thing here is that the um the sole unit's been made using sugar cane and then the upper is made using tensile material so a lot more natural and a lot less synthetics coming into the um into the footwear there so in 18 minutes or so that's the last uh, 18 to 20 years of my life. Wow. <laughs> really exciting projects there too. And it's, uh, it's actually what's, uh, obviously for the audience that are listening, do drop some questions into the Q&A, but it's the, it's the diversity of the thought process here as well that, you know, you're not going down the traditional route of going and sourcing brand new fabrics. Just absolutely love the fact that you have gone back and sourced um you know, vintage pieces that are have not necessarily been thought of. The maps, for example, the printed mm. um, silk, all of that, that is. So in terms of the supply of that, obviously there must yeah. come a point where that supply then um, becomes yeah. harder to, to reach. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not a linear supply chain by any means, and it's, it's very unpredictable. Um, and sort of one of the, the good things, I guess, that's happened in the in the decade or so since I started the company, it was 2009, I set up my own company and, and starting with one of those parachutes, made it into eight garments and, and things have really grown, grown from there. 
But back then, if I wanted to, I could buy 8,000 parachutes at a time. And now, because everyone's really woken up a lot more to sustainability and how you can reuse original materials, actually, it, we found it more difficult to find them. But because of the scale we work at, people still take us quite seriously. We've done projects, for example, where we did one with Eastpac, where um, Eastpac very famous for their for their backpacks. I'm sorry, I don't think that's me with the the, the beeping in the background. No, it's but, mine. Um, no worries. Um, but with the this project, we worked with these beautiful, actually completely waterproof um, jackets. Again, military. We used to have a woodland camouflage and a desert camouflage here in the UK, and they replaced it with one called Multicam. And then all of a sudden, we were being offered tens of thousands of um, of jackets in the old camouflage. So this, it's this kind of planned obsolescence. Um, and another example is with the parachutes in particular. We're able to get them for one of basically two reasons. Um, parachutes that you see being uh, people jumping out the back of planes, if they've done 50 and sometimes 100 jumps, they have to get rid of the parachute. Right. And then the other thing is they have a shelf life. After 12 years, they have to get rid of them. So there's there's a lot of stuff out there that um, I guess it's kind of good news. Often it doesn't get used, right? And so our, our job and, and the way I look at things is almost um, a little bit like one of those fish that you see swimming alongside sharks that clean their teeth. Uh, they're called remoas. And I always think it's quite a good analogy for what we do because we, we swim alongside pretty big brands and big industry and we clean it. And then I think you always have the opportunity to kind of talk to the shark and then maybe you can steer the shark. And that's where it gets interesting. And that's what we try to do. Having influence there, that's great. And so um, in terms of the supply chain going forward, have you, you know, are, are you expand? Obviously parachutes, the military have been a key part of your sourcing. Have you looked at other areas um or ways obviously there's recycling companies that are gathering materials do you mm. work with any of them for example yeah we um it's a really good question over the years we've used everything from life rafts to eurostar seat covers to blankets to hot air balloons to all of this stuff that already um already exists what we don't tend to do is we won't do anything where we're breaking things back down to a fiber level or working with that, yeah. that level of supplier um, but it's it's certainly something that we're we're interested in. We have done projects, for example, where we've taken Tyvek that's normally used for the housing industry, so remnants. It's normally used for insulating walls to stop um, moisture coming through and, and things. And we've been able to use that because the sheer scale of the housing industry, you know, remnants to them is still tens of thousands of meters. Um, but yeah, so going forward, I, 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 I'm of course I'm really interested around our place within uh, sort of the industry, how we can continue to provoke thoughts, and I'm particularly interested around how far circularity will truly go, because we know, of course, with synthetics, um, circularity is great, but it also has problems, right? Microplastics, and you know, you're still using synthetics. So a, a big area, particularly working with Timberland, has been around regenerative agriculture and, and actually going back to older um, farming practices that are a lot more, uh, essentially a lot more planet and people positive, drawing more carbon from the atmosphere than you're putting out. And the really good thing is that you can do that with, with cattle, you can do it with rubber, cotton. And the, the, the great thing about all of this, um, is so much of it's common sense, or just going back to what we used to do, before everything really became sped up and pretty attritional on the earth. Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, utilizing our natural resources better just totally makes sense. And as you say, you know, look back to what we've done in the past. We have a lot of wool in this country. We have, um, and um, obviously we've got cows, we've got all sorts of animals that are, um, you know, through their lifespan of providing, whether it's milk or meat or whatever, there are those um, mm. extra elements of, of materials um, and yeah, so what, what sort of this regenerative farming, what sort of areas are you looking at specifically? Well, um, just to be really clear, this is this is all credit Timberland, um, who, who've been fortunate to work with. There's an amazing documentary called Kiss the Ground, which I'd really recommend people 
people um, watching, but it's all around essentially the degradation of soil and how we can be a lot more um, positive in the way that we're farming and the way that we're working with, with land in general. And in simple terms with cattle farming, what tends to happen at the moment is most cattle, unfortunately, are held in relatively small pens. And that's not to say necessarily here in the UK, but when you think globally and you think particularly in the US, there tend to be pens with thousands of cattle in one place. And those cattle are incredibly degrading on the, on the soil. Very quickly, it turns pretty much to dust. Um, but if you can move those cattle from place to place, and the reason I mentioned the good news is it's kind of going back to the old sort of um, ways of doing things, it means, of course, it allows the, the, the soil to repair, the, the grass to continue to grow, and essentially carbon to be uh, uh, drawn in a much more positive way than, than just this very attritional way. And it's not an exact science at all, but there's a lot of experiments happening. Of course, cattle, I've just mentioned, but Timberland have invested a lot in um, rubber, for example, um, planta plantations in in Thailand in particular, where if you look at a um, responsibly run rubber plantation, it's very diverse. You know, really a lot, a lot of other um, flora and fauna actually happening in, in that area. And the moment you go to sort of monocrop, it, it's incredibly bad. So it's, as I say, it's really this, this shift towards, um, <laughs> towards what we used to be doing when I think we cared for the planet a lot more than we do today. Absolutely. And even I'm um, just reflecting on wool, very few people know that obviously, well, we know wool is biodegradable, but actually wool, if you put it back into the ground, provides nitrogen. So mm -hmm. it's actually, uh, you know, I know it's one of the products that I work with in my in my own business, but we we actually actively tell our customers take the wool at the end of life, take the wool and put it back in the ground because it's actually good for the ground too. So obviously yeah. this is undyed wool, but yeah, it's one of those things that it's it's educating people as well because there you know there's there are so many good options out there that we need to be moving towards which will all help with um yeah yeah i, I mean it's funny in a in a micro level i am um, just before covid hit in fact i'd invested in a wormery so i live in a, a brutalist tower block in in south london so unfortunately we're not blessed with the space that you guys have up in Scotland, right? So you have to do things in quite a small scale. But I've done quite a lot of research and learned that 70% of your domestic waste, so what you create at home, can be composted. And I found it absolutely kind of amazing what uh, a wormery is actually able to get through. And to your point, everything from wool to, of course, cardboards and any, um, the vast majority of food waste and things, of course, absolutely amazing. And again, just common sense, right? And how long does it take? Have you been? Guys, they're they're surprisingly <laughs> hungry, and they get through a lot. And they've, um, I mean, the wormery is fantastic because it has different sort of layers that have built up. But um, yeah, they're they're very good for fending, sort of fending for themselves. And there's no, uh, yeah, there's no worries if you have to go on holiday. You just leave, leave them plenty of food, and they they crack on. Definitely must look into that. Um, mm. Just going on on the fabrics, you mentioned Tencel and some of the natural fabrics you used. It was referenced, I think, to the to the shoes there. Um, you know, in terms of your 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 bigger collections, where you've got, I guess, more volume, and uh, is that something that you're looking to use as well? Uh, yes, I mean, we use we use Tencel as well within Rayburn. We're again just complete transparency, Joan. We, even things like cotton at the moment, we're obviously well aware of some of the, the challenges that are happening now, supply chain, and we are still making a lot from of our t-shirts and, and crew necks and hoodies and all of those things from, from cotton. So we're always, I guess, looking for um, responsible alternatives and, and try to be as transparent in the way that, we, um, that we're working as possible. It's definitely not an exact science, but... Um, over the years, we've we've tested a lot, um, yeah, of, of different different ways of working, and the same through to dyeing processes, print processes, all of those kind of things as well. That, uh, uh, of course, ultimately just impact on a on a um, sort of garment's life cycle and, and what happens next as well. Mm -hmm. And sort of moving on to the manufacturing side, just wonderful to see um, in the the factor in your in your workspace, your studio, and people making as well. Um, is that where you make most of your products or do you have other 
outlets as yeah, well. No, we, um, we make, or well, we do all of our remade garments here within the studio environment, but no, our, our um, jersey products, we're doing predominantly in, in Portugal, we've done denim in Walthamstow, so um, East London, we've done different parts in through the UK over the years, but it's our, our main focus has been how we can grow the, the remade aspect. But then our fully recycled program we do in Asia because mm -hmm. we, we again, I think we're guilty as we grew of doing some pretty bad things supply chain wise, where we were shipping fantastic technical materials from, from Japan and Korea, for example, bringing them here to the UK, shipping them to Europe to make something, coming back to the UK and then shipping a lot back to back to Asia, which is a big part of our, our business. And again, we're, we're still quite small, so it's difficult to know the full carbon footprint on that. But I can tell you it wasn't great. So our philosophy really has been, let's try and make the highest possible quality item in the right place to make it. And so that's allowed us to kind of, um, I, I, I guess, sort of think globally, but then also act locally as much as we can. And one of the things certainly we're interested in longer term is, at the moment, we do remade in England products, but what would happen if we were doing remade in Brazil or remade in uh, Portland or remade in wherever, you know, Tokyo, actually then working with local materials and potentially through the right collaborations and partnerships, you can again, just think about this real global local, uh, sort of localization, but not easy, hey? Absolutely. I mean, the, the textile industry and the fashion industry has been notorious for that the concept of, um, you know, the wool comes from Australia, it's been shipped to China or Taiwan or somewhere to get a process then moved. And there could be 20 different journeys mm. bringing all the elements together. So, but it is hard to manufacture in one, even within the UK, because you still need zips and buttons. And, and yes, we do have that, you know, there's so much more focus on UK manufacture and support for textile companies and spinning, et cetera, you know, there's there's so much happening again, but we lost a lot of that through the 90s and noughties. So yeah. when people outsource, so it's it's how we can try and do local, obviously supporting UK is a big, uh, um, you know, we try and do as much as we can, but um, it is trying to work within the elements that yeah. we've got. It does, I have to say, hopefully I haven't got rosy tinsy glasses on this, but it, if we take COVID, away from it it did feel in the last sort of five years that there were a lot more businesses that were you know opening or reopening and skills coming back and I know we've got so many challenges because of Brexit and all the things we all know but I do I do have hope and I guess we're, we're trying in our own small way to keep skills in the country and and to, to grow as best we can as well and be part of that conversation yeah, uh, just on that and the skills, um, obviously it, it, skills is a real issue, certainly in Scotland with some of the both textile and manufacturing units um, to recruit, but also to get good people that have those skills and retrain younger people. How are you finding that um, in terms of obviously you're London, so you've got a, a bigger pool to work with, uh, yeah. but how, how are you finding that recruiting for, for good skills? Yeah, it's... Um as you've touched on I mean, it's not it's not easy our um our seamstress team here um i only say seamstresses because that's the only people that ever apply for the jobs we'd be happy to take male female but all of our um seamstresses unbelievably skilled but predominantly from bulgaria and estonia these sorts of areas but um it, it's really difficult to then uh step on find people then train them to the specifics of uh, working with parachutes every day or quite, you know, it takes a certain mindset to go, yeah, yeah I can turn that, that um, yes. upper jacket into a, into a panda bear. Um, but in terms of then the, the, the sort of younger uh, team members coming through, I have to say it's, it's incredibly inspiring for me because when I just think about designers in particular, you've got a completely different mindset. You know, when I was studying, I remember being sat in front of my first computer, I think last year at school, being told, oh, this is going to be the future, right? Whereas now, of course, we've got, um, I wouldn't even say young designers, but just new thinkers that are so completely digitally focused. And that's really exciting to think how you can, can really um, bring some of the merits and the, the positives of the digital space into the physical as well. And I think we that's really the way that we need to operate as a business, you know, really... On the one hand, a lot of what we do is it's relatively analog. You know, it's incredibly high skilled and um, uh, uh, and very hands on. 
but then as a modern brand you have to be in the digital space as well so um yeah it's that kind of alchemy i guess that you need to get right yeah and i guess you know it's great to hear that you've opened a shop in london uh, as well um, because it's that physical interaction where people can touch the product so i did wonder you know with your um unique pieces the sort of one-offs how you were managed to sell those was, was that previously sold online or how, how did you manage that yeah i mean um to be clear it's we do we do do some pieces which are one of one, but we do many pieces that are one of fifty. One so there are one of fifty pieces, but each one will be slightly different. Yeah. And so we we do have a wholesale um, partnerships. I mentioned stores like Selfridges and um, Flannels, for example. Uh, I think we're in six or seven stores throughout throughout the UK, um, and then a lot of really good independent speciality stores. And the, and the reason that that's so important is if if it's an independent store you know it's going to be the buyer invariably that, that man or lady you know it's it's their store it's their money behind the, the the store itself and for them to put their faith in your products as well it's because they really understand it so they've taken the time to learn and and we've hopefully taken the time to really educate and, and sort of inspire but it it's um it, it's so important because what we do isn't normal. It's not, oh, there's, you know, there's a, a sort of standard collection uh, that you can find from, from other brands. It has to then be about finding the right, um, yeah, it's the right partners, right? All yeah. of this is about partnerships. Absolutely. And talking of partnerships, just the collaborations, obviously, you've got a wonderful history of working with some fantastic brands. And I just wondered, um, again, for newer people to, to this business, what, how did you how did those evolve? I mean, obviously, one will lead to another to some extent, but did you actively go out seeking them? How did you do that? Yeah, I think the, the first thing I do is actually take a step back. When I was studying at university, first at, at Middlesex and then at the Royal College, one of the things I found so beneficial was industry projects. So um, when I think back, we worked on everything from sometimes uh, you won't physically actually working with a company, but it would be, OK, if you're designing a magazine, which magazine would you want to choose and pretend you were um, sort of designing for? But then when I got to the Royal College, we did projects with everyone from Swarovski Crystal to Pomery Champagne to Levi's to Umro to all of these different um, industry projects. And I, I sort of entered every single one because I had no idea if I'd be any good. And at that stage, it's a really, it's a really useful time just to experiment and kind of work out quite quickly what you're not good at or what you don't enjoy because that, that's kind of what you should be doing. And then when I started the company, uh, we were very lucky early on. Um, I went through part of the British Fashion Council. Uh, they have a scheme here called New Gen, and it's an award scheme where they give you a small space to begin with within London Fashion Week. And then step by step, you kind of grow by doing an installation and then a um, uh, eventually actually a presentation, then full catwalk shows, you know, 600 people, men's wear, women's wear. And things kind of grew, I guess, um, both steadily and scarily, I suppose, in, in equal measure. But through that journey, um, I think because of the clarity of the way that we communicated and the uniqueness of the offer, the USP of the brand, we attracted early on a lot of interest. And uh, I really wanted to be known for, for outerwear, so jackets and coats in particular. So uh, when we were approached by Montclair, so Montclair, a big Italian outerwear company, it made perfect sense to work with, with them. And I've ended the project with Barber, as you mentioned earlier, and all of this is on our, on our website. We have a, um, a dedicated area for, for collaborations. So I think it's really important that you choose things that are going to help to bolster your, your brand as you grow. Mm -hmm. And when we wanted to first start doing accessories, then working with Eastpac, I showed the bag earlier, was the perfect way to cement, oh, Rayburn do accessories. Yeah. And then another example, we, we have no thought of doing our own footwear, but by working first with Clarks and then with Palladium and now with Timberland, you have this amazing opportunity to work with experts in their field, but bring something new to the brand. And we've been really, really fortunate that over the years, it sounds a bit crazy, but we we haven't, uh, excuse the uh, bin lorry, 
we are in London. Um, but we, it, it, it's been companies coming to us as opposed to us actively going out and seeking partnerships. And the, the final thing I'd sort of wrap up with on that is just, we've said no to lots and lots of things that didn't feel right. Mm. And I think back to the t-shirt that I showed to begin with and having those values, the remade, reduced, recycled, anyone that we work with, ideally we're doing one or two or ideally all three of those things. Otherwise we don't do it. And it gives us a really, really good way just to uh, bring structure into, into partnerships. And I think that keeps your brand pure as well, because, you know, you're sticking with your ethos. Um, if it doesn't fit, as you say, don't do it. So that, that's really good advice. I'm just going to jump in. There's a couple of uh, points that come in. So the first one was, um, do you think it is possible to change consumer habits to move away from fast fashion? I know having good quality products is the answer, but this comes with high price points. So how do we bring what you do into the mainstream? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, I think the first thing to acknowledge is that there's still a need for affordable clothing, you know, absolutely. And particularly um, with the current financial um, situation, which let's face it, isn't going to end anytime soon. I think it's really about balance on, on these things because, uh, you know, fast fashion isn't always bad it doesn't always need to be bad and, and certainly through collaboration through innovation we have an opportunity to, to to turn things into a much more positive space i think fast fashion in tandem with over production and over saturation then you have a really really dangerous um yeah um sort of mix i guess for want of a better word but i i'd like to think um I suppose even within Rayburn, the, the biggest um, thing that we've we're still trying to overcome with our with our customers, and we're we're so proud of the community that we've grown and everything. But early on, we were known as being pretty conceptual and very high price point. And if I'm being really honest, early on, the quality shouldn't probably wasn't as high as it needed to be. The fit wasn't as good as it needed to be. The last five years for the business, we've really really improved our our offer, and so. A, fully organic double face crew neck jersey <clears throat> item like this for example uh with a beautiful let's say double face very high quality that will last for a long time it's 99 pounds it's not 400 pounds or 300 and it's not the most affordable either so, uh, sorry the most it's the, accessible exactly yeah yeah and so it's actually the biggest thing that we're we're trying to overcome uh, you know a t-shirt from rayburn now is 49 pounds for for um we call it standard issues so our, our kind of baseline um and again we don't want to be cheap we don't want to be the cheapest there but it is about finding that right balance and i think it's as much then about how you can um as, as, as a sort of touch on hopefully educate people that maybe you just don't need as much of everything because we all know that i think a lot of the same stats about how little most clothing is worn i think that's that's really important in this conversation Definitely. I mean, I, I think you touched on, you know, the reality is fast fashion um, to date has been mass selling of basic things that and, and in many cases, the statistics are showing that lots hasn't actually even got to the consumer. It's been uh, it's never been to the shop even because there was too much ordered, etc. So, you know, that practice actually has yeah. changed yeah. We touched a little bit earlier that. UKFT, you know, through um, some work they're doing with the government who have, um, there, there's there's support now for helping drive businesses, certainly within the UK, in a more sustainable direction. So it'll be interesting to see what that, how that uh, pans out. And, but mm. a lot of it must come into educating consumers to think differently. Also, you know, uh, there's a lot more rental um, concepts around yeah. people are becoming more comfortable with that and reusing and passing on so that that's really good yeah so the, the final thing I'd, I'd sort of say as well is um, we still when we as an industry we still do a lot of pretty crazy things and particularly blended fabrics so cotton and poly yeah. which still can't be extruded at, at scale at all Absolutely. you know there are pilot programs but we're still pumping up billions of garments. Essentially, no one can can recycle at the moment, um, and that's why I really kind of question if we can we can solve some pretty big things quite quickly. You know, by, just by really looking upstream, not even that far at how we're then designing products. Um, 
yeah, and I, I, I guess when we then think downstream, the next 10 years really need to see some pretty big um, innovation around scalability for, for recycling, bringing things back down to fiber level and, and designing things for disassembly so that you can already be thinking through. Yeah, yeah, it's going to need a lot of brainy people. And again, I guess coming back to your, your point earlier, when I think about the newer and, and some younger team members here at Rayburn, you know, I, I look to them for ideas, right? Because, you know, we're, we're all part of hopefully a, a future solution. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've got one other, um, it's actually from an independent store owner who's really interested in your uh, product and wondering how uh, she can stock it. So um, she's also been to a few of the, um, the shows. Oh, that's very okay. kind. So all of our information is up on the um, on the website, so rayburndesign.co.uk. But uh, yeah, there's a contact page and, and we'll be really happy to help. And the other thing I'd, I'd sort of say is that, please, if anyone is in London, come to our store, you know, meet the team um, because they're incredibly passionate, incredibly knowledgeable and, and will want to do everything they can to help. And we also here at the Rayburn Lab, we hold monthly tours, again, um, part of really just our, our quest around education and inspiration. The funny thing there is we used to do them completely for free and we found that probably 50% didn't turn up. We now charge five pounds and we give the money to charity. There's a fantastic local um, charity just here called the Off Centre. And the moment we started charging people five pounds, people, everyone turns up, the money goes to charity and it's a really good story. So we're always That's a win-win for all. <laughs> yeah, kind of testing all these different ways to to hopefully do good things. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, sort of, we've got uh, just less than sort of ten minutes left. I was just going to, in terms of your hopes for the future and how you see the direction um, mm. now, and obviously you're 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 very much leading the way with your thought process, your design, your innovation, using materials wisely and more responsibly. Um, what are your thoughts on the future and how that that will pan out? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I don't have a, a, a magic ball on this. I, I really wish I did. But I suppose what I'm very aware of is we haven't in the fashion industry had the equivalent of David Attenborough looking down the lens on Blue Planet 2 and saying, it's up to you to make the difference. And I really struggle with this because we've had so many horrific incidents, Rena Plaza factory, you know, um, I, and we know how, how detrimental a lot of what we're doing as an industry is to the planet, but yet there hasn't been that, that real thing that, that wakes people up and shakes people up. And I guess my, my own perspective that is that maybe that won't happen, but what will happen is lots of micro experiments that in their own way will bubble and, and will need to come together because I don't think there's one easy solution because of the complexity of the problem that we have. It's going to be all of these different things. You touch on loaning and, um, of course, I mean, we haven't even really talked about just making things well to begin with. You know, the longevity of a product, just keeping something in circulation is kind of the best thing you can do. My good friend, also De Castro, who you might, might know, set up fa Fashion Revolution, and you know her her statement's always the most sustainable item of clothing you have is already in your closet right it's already in your your wardrobe and how can you keep that thing going i touched on it earlier that with rayburn we we do um free repairs on on our, all of our garments but we're we've done initiatives around black friday for example where you can't buy anything new from rayburn and all we do is repair other items from and we've done that for rayburn but other brands as well we've done we closed our store last Black Friday and, and all you could buy was secondhand clothing from, from other brands. We partnered with an amazing company called Responsible. But at the moment, all of these little experiments are all quite small. And you've got some big companies like Recircled in the US that are now working on scale of recycling, you know, tens of thousands of, of pieces, breaking them down to, to material level and recycling all of the pieces. But we're, but we're so far off the real, real big uh, kind of seismic shift that we're going to need. And, you know, I guess thinking long term, and this is this is really, really crazy. I went to I went to an amazing lecture in in New York. In fact, it's the last place I traveled before COVID. And I I, I sat and, and listened to an amazing talk um, from a guy that ran one of the biggest uh, waste facilities in New York. 
and he was explaining how an iceberg lettuce that you might have put in in your bin because it went a little bit moldy it's gone into the landfill that he he has there and then that item 30 years later is exactly the same it's like vacuum packed sealed in time right and the, the crazy thing about all of this we're going to be mining those landfills in the future right for the synthetics and all the stuff that we've thrown away to then make into hopefully useful things because we're running out of raw materials and again this is a it sounds kind of abstract now but it it's going to be all of these things to kind of keep stuff going that we have made and then how we can better work with with um with what we've either already wasted or or, or, or be more efficient with what we're making in the future yeah. it's a really long answer i'm sorry the yeah, truth I'm, just, I'm visualizing that iceberg lettuce in its plastic wrapper coming out you know yeah. <laughs> virtually as it is in in 10 years time um so yeah anyway it's um we're coming towards the end it I've been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And um, if anybody else in who's watching wants to pop a question in, uh, we've got another couple of minutes. Otherwise, um, we'll wrap this up, literally, and um, say thank you so much, especially as you've just come off a flight. And you've done really well with jet lag. No, no, it's been a, a, a real pleasure, Joan. And I guess the other thing, just to wrap up from our side, as I touched on through the, through the talk, I've always just seen all of this about a, you know being a conversation and and the need for collaboration and certainly if, if there's anyone maybe that had a question that pops up tomorrow or whatever please feel free to to ask i mean all of our um details are, are online so rayburn design please follow us on socials so rayburn design i'm christopher rayburn and i just think it's only by asking and, and hopefully answering some of the difficult questions together that we can make a make a difference so so thank you for the forum Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much from everyone um, on here and from Expo North. And we look forward to seeing what you do in the future as well. Amazing. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.